utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Milton's duty than yours, especially when intellectual pleasures await you. The German grammar is on the table. Pray open it, page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is no, leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. <coughs> Sometimes I think he's so serious that he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so competitively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he looks a little bored every time we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish you would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I know you certainly would. You know things like German and geology influence a man very much. <laughs> I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I am not sure I could desire to reclaim him. I am not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. <laughs> and as a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful <coughs> secrets of my life. If I didn't enter them, I should probably forget all about them. <laughs> Memory, my dear Cecily, is a diary we all carry about with us. Yes, but it's usually chronicles things that haven't happened or couldn't possibly have happened. I believe memory is responsible for all the three-volume novels that the library sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you read in this prison? Oh, how clever you are! Did it end happily? I hope it did not end happily. Novels that end, ha end happily depress me so much. <laughs> the good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so. But it seems so very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I used the word in the sense of lost or misled. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. <laughs> Dr. Chasen, this is indeed a pleasure. <laughs> and how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll in the park with you, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. <laughs> Indeed, I was thinking about that, and not my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. <laughs> <laughs> that is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> <laughs> Monday afternoon. Ah, yes, he usually does enjoy his Sunday in London. 
He is not one of those whose sole and aim in life is enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother is. But I shall not disturb Ageria and her pupil any longer. Ageria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical illusion, Mary, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong. I think, dear Doctor, I will have that stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a short walk might do as good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might even go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. <laughs> <laughs> Geography. Poor political economy. Oh, horrid, horrid gem! A Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned you in his prison in the garden. He said he wished to speak with you anxiously for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come out here. And you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. I feel rather frightened. I've never met any really wicked person before. <laughs> I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. <gasps> he does! <laughs> you are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I'm not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. And you, I see from your card, are my Uncle Jack's brother, my cousin Ernest, my wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I am not really wicked at all, Cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I am wicked. Well, if you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in some very inexcusable manner. I hope you are not leading a double life, pretending to be really wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Oh, of course I have been rather reckless. I'm so glad to hear it. <laughs> in fact, now you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so very proud of that. Though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here than you. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack will be back till Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment, but I am obliged to go off by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. Well, couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement. <coughs> One wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he would like to talk to you about your immigrating. About my what? Your immigrating. Uncle Jack has gone out to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. Well, I don't think he will require neckties. Uncle is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. <laughs> well, the accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I haven't the time this afternoon. Then would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. 
I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. <laughs> that is because I am hungry. Oh, God bless <laughs> me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely different life, one should have regular and wholesome meals. <laughs> Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A marechal meal? No, I'd sooner have pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You're the prettiest girl I ever saw. <laughs> Miss Prism says that all good looks are snare. They are indeed a snare that every sensible man should like to be caught in. <laughs> oh, I don't think I should like to catch a sensible man. I wouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> Too much alone, Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. <laughs> a misanthrope, I can understand. A woman throw, never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, were distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. <coughs> Men should be more careful, as very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. Well, is a man not equally attractive when married? <coughs> no married man is ever attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Except to his wife. And often, I am told, not even to her. <laughs> <laughs> that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be relied on. <coughs> Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke horticulturally. <laughs> Sooner than I expected. Dr. Chasmel, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother! More shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead! <laughs> your brother now is dead. Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. <laughs> Dear Mr. Worthing, you have my sincere condolences, and you also have the consolation of knowing that you were ever the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest, he had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the last? No, he died abroad, in Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. What's the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. <laughs> As a man sows, so shall he reap. <coughs> Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to. 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 Mr. Worthing, will the interment take place here? No, he seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? Well, I fear that hardly points to a very serious state of mind at the last. But you would, of course, wish me to make some slight allusion to the tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion, joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. <laughs> I have preached it at harvest celebrations. 
christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation, and festival days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral as part of a charity sermon benefiting the society for the prevention of discontent in the other orders. The, the bishop who was present was much struck by the, the analogies that I drew. That reminds me, Dr. Trustle, you mentioned christenings, I believe. I suppose you know how to christen all right? I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. Is there any particular evidence in whom you are interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure <coughs> usually are. But it is not for any child, dear doctor. No, I'm very fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you've been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. Have you any doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. But I don't know if it would bother you in any way, or perhaps you think I'm a little too old now. No, no, not at all, not at all. The sprinkling, or indeed the immersion of adults, is perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehension. Sprinkling is all that is required, or I dare say advisable. Our weather is so changeable. At what hour would you wish the ceremony before? I might talk round about five, if that would be okay. Admirably, admirably. I have a similar, two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins occurring in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Jenkins the Carter, a most hard-working man. Now, I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. How would half past five do? Oh, perfect, perfectly. And now, Mr. Worthing, I shall intrude no longer into a house of sorrow. But I would beg you to not be too bowed down by grief. What to us may seem bitter trials may be blessings in disguise. This seems to me to be a blessing of a, an extremely obvious nature. Ah. Uncle Jack, I am pleased to see you back. Oh, but what horrid clothes you have got on. Do go change them. Cecily. My child, my child. What's the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you had a toothache, and I have got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother! Who? <laughs> Your brother! Ernest! He arrived about half an hour ago. That's nonsense. I haven't got a brother. You wouldn't be so heartless as to disown him, would you? I will go and tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? Anything else. It's enough to drive one perfectly frank. 
Of course I admit that the faults were all on my side, but I must say that I think Brother John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, you shake hands with Ernest, or I shall never forgive you. Never forgive me. Never, never, never. This is the last time I shall ever do it. It was splendid, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? <laughs> I think we should perhaps leave the two brothers together. Certainly you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prison, my little task of reconciliation is over. But you have done a beautiful action today, my child. We must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. <laughs> You young scoundrel! You must leave this place at once. I don't want that bunger in here. <coughs> I have put Mr. Ernest things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? His luggage, sir. I might pack it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hot boxes, and a long floating basket. I am afraid I can't stay for more than a week this time. <laughs> Meriden, call for the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been sent to go back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I haven't been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk about Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go up and change? Why, it is perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for someone who is actually staying with you in your house as a guest for an entire week. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. I certainly won't leave you, so long as you are in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. <laughs> if I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I should think it very unkindly if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you're not too long about it. I never saw anybody take so long to dress with such little result. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, that is better than not being always overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. <laughs> your vanity is ridiculous, your conduct an outrage, and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you have got to catch the four five, and I hope you'll have a pleasant journey back to town. This bun running <laughs> as you thought has not been a great success. I think it has been a great success. I am in love with Cecily, that is everything. But I must see her before I go and make arrangements for another bun Marie. Ah, oh, there she is. I merely came out to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to all the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I am afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful parting from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. The dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Mary, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope I shall not offend you, Cecily, if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. And if you will allow me, 
I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's work of her own thoughts and impressions and consequently meant for publication. I hope that when it appears in volume form, you shall order a copy. <laughs> but pray, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I'm at absolute perfection. Do go on. I'm quite <coughs> ready for more. <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one must speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. <laughs> Cecily, ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think that you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't make much sense, does it? <laughs> Cecily, the dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell us to come round next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uncle Jack would be very annoyed to know you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care for anybody in the entire world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? <laughs> Why, of course, you silly boy. We have been engaged these last three months. For the last three months? Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course, a man who is often talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, Ernest. But I fell in love with you. Darling, and when was the engagement actually set? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence. I decided to settle the matter one way or the other, and, after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under that dear old tree there. <laughs> and the next day, I went out and bought this little ring in your name, and this little bangle with the true lover's knot that I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. That's the reason I've always given for your leading such a bad life. And of course, I keep all your dear letters. My letters? <laughs> My own dear, sweet Cecily, I've never written you any letters. Well, you mean to hardly remind me of that, Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> I only remember too well how I was forced to write your letters for you. <laughs> I always wrote three times a week, and sometimes oftener. Do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The last three you wrote to me after I had broken off our engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled <laughs> that even now I can't read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of March last, you may read the entry if you like. Today I have broken off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it's better to do so. <laughs> the weather still continues charming. Why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? I have done nothing at all, Cecily. I am indeed very hurt to hear that you broke off our engagement. <laughs> Particularly when the weather was so charming. <laughs> 
It would have hardly been any serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. Dear romantic boy, I hope your hair curls naturally. Does it? Yes, darling. With a little help from others. I'm so glad. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily. I don't think I could, now that we have actually met. <laughs> and of course, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. Now, don't laugh at me, darling. But it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. <laughs> the name alone inspires absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. My dear child, do you mean to say if my name were not Ernest, that you couldn't love me? But what other name? Oh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. I don't like the name Algernon. <laughs> but my own dear, sweet, loving, little darling, I can't possibly see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It isn't at all a bad name, it's just rather an aristocratic name. Why, half the chaps who get into bankruptcy court are called Algernon. <laughs> but seriously, Cecily, if I were called Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But I'm afraid I would not be able to give you my undivided attention. Your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in all the practice of the rites and ceremonials of the church. <laughs> yes, Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. <laughs> then I must see him at once on a most important christening. I mean on most important business. Oh. I shan't be away more than half an hour. Well, considering that we have been engaged since 14th of February last, and I am only now meeting you for the first time, I find it rather hard for you to leave me for such a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. <laughs> I must enter his proposal into my diary. Miss Fairfax is here to see Mr. Wadding on very important business. Miss Fairfax states. Well, isn't Mr. Wadding in his library? Mr. Wadding went over in the direction of the rector some time ago. Ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Wadding is sure to be back soon. And you can bring tea. Yes, miss. Be the proper sphere for a man. 
And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? <laughs> and I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of the system, so you don't mind my looking at you through my glasses. Oh no, Gwendolyn, not at all. I enjoy being looked at. <laughs> You are here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no. I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also. Oh, no. I haven't a mother, nor any relations, in fact. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the help of this prison, had the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I'm Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, Mr. Worthing never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How very secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. <laughs> I am not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. <laughs> but I am bound to state that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were well, slightly older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly, pray do, Gwendolyn, I feel that whenever anything, anyone has anything unfortunate to say, one should always be quite candid. <laughs> well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully forty-two, and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men with the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. <laughs> I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. But did you say Ernest? Yes. Why, it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, oh, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I've never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. <laughs> Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship such as ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am to be his. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <coughs> Dearest Gwendolyn, there's no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the facts next week. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. My darling, Cecily, I fear there has been some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday the latest. <laughs> There must be some misconception, for well, Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It is certainly very curious, for Ernest asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One must always have some, something sensational to read on the train. <laughs> I am so sorry if it is any disappointment to you, Cecily, but it appears I have the pride claim. It would distress me, dearest Gwen. More than I can tell you, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. <laughs> If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement.
entanglement my dear boy has got himself into. Well, I'll never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow marks of manners. <laughs> when I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am very glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious our social spheres have been widely different. Shall I lay tea here, as usual, Miss? Yes, as usual. Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Well, yes, quite a few. Why, from the tops of one of those hills, one can see five counties. <laughs> five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. Mm, I suppose that is why you live in town. <laughs> Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country if anybody who is, anybody does. <laughs> the country always falls me to death. Oh, that is what the newspapers are calling agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it at present. Indeed, it is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. <laughs> May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl. But I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. <laughs> Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses. <laughs> Not. What could have put such 
such an idea into your pretty little head. Oh, thank you. You may. <laughs> I felt there had been some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon <laughs> Moncrief! Ah. Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh, <laughs> is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. <laughs> but my name certainly is John. It has been John for years. A gross deception has been played upon the both of us. My sweet wounded Cecily. Oh, my poor wrong Gwendolyn. <laughs> <laughs> you will call me sister, will you not? <laughs> there is just one question I would like to be allowed to ask my garden. An admirable idea. Hmm. Mr. Worthing, there is just one question I should like to be allowed to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest. So it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. In fact, it is the first time in my life that I have ever been put into such a painful position, and I have really no experience with that kind of thing at all. <coughs> However, I may tell you quite frankly that I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. I've never had a brother, and I certainly have no intention of ever having a brother in the future. <laughs> no brother at all? None. Have you never a brother of any kind? Never, not even of any kind. <laughs> I am afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It isn't a very pleasant situation for a young girl to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will not venture to come after us there. No, men are such cowards, aren't they? <laughs> this ghastly state of things is what you call Bunburying, I suppose? Yes, and a perfectly wonderful Bunbury it is. The most wonderful Bunbury I have ever had in my entire life. Well, you've no right whatsoever to Bunbury here. That's absurd. One has a right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows that. Serious Bunburyist? Good heavens! Well, one must be serious about something. If one wants to have any amusement in life, I happen to be serious about Bunbury. What on earth you are serious about, I haven't the remotest idea about everything, I should fancy. You have such an absolutely trivial nature. The only satisfaction I had in the whole of this wretched trouble is that your friend Bunbury has quite exploded. You want to be able to run down to the country quite so often as you used to, dear Algy, and a very good thing. Your brother is a little off colour, isn't he, dear Jack? You want to be able to disappear to London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was? Not a bad thing, either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, how you can take in such a sweet, innocent girl like that, I find inexcusable to say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defense at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, that is all. I love her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There's certainly no chance of your marrying Miss Cardew. I don't think there is much likelihood, dear Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax being united. <coughs> well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I certainly wouldn't talk about it. It's very vulgar to talk about one's business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and then merely at dinner parties. <laughs> How you can sit there, calmly eating muffins, while we are in this horrible trouble is beyond me. I can't make it out. It seems to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get on my cuffs. <laughs> Besides, one should always eat muffins quite calmly. It's the only way to eat them. 
I say it quite heartless, you're eating muffins at all under the circumstances. When I am in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed, when I am in really great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately will tell you, I, re uh, I refuse everything except food and drink. At the present moment, I am eating because I am unhappy. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. This is no reason why you should eat them all in that greedy way. I wish you would have tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens, I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you said it was heartless to eat muffins. I said it was heartless of you under the circumstances. That is a very different matter. <laughs> that may be, but the muffins are the same. Algy, I wish to goodness you would go. That's absurd. You're asking me to go without first having some dinner. I never go without having my dinner. Nobody ever does except vegetarians and people like that. <laughs> Besides, I have just made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at 5.30, and naturally I will take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened Ernest. It's absurd. Besides, I have every right to be christened. There is no evidence that I have ever been christened by anybody. I think it highly probable that I never was, and so does Dr. Chasuble. You, however, have been christened. Yes, but I haven't been christened for years. Yes, but you have been christened, and that is the important thing. Quite so, so I know my constitution can stand it. If you're not quite sure about your ever having been christened, I should think it very dangerous your venturing upon it now. It might make you very unwell. You can hardly have forgotten that very recently someone closely connected with you was very nearly carried away in Paris by a severe chill. <laughs> yes, but you said yourself that a severe chill is not hereditary. It used to be, I know, but I dare say it is now. <laughs> Science is always making such wonderful improvements. <laughs> <laughs> that is nonsense. You're always talking nonsense. Jack, you're up the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. I told you I was particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. Then why on earth do you allow tea cake to be served up for your guest? What ideas you have of hospitality. <laughs> Algernon. I wish you would go. I've already asked you to leave. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet, and there's still a muffin left. The fact that they did not follow us at once into the house, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. <laughs> they don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? But I haven't coughed. They're looking at us. What a frontery. Oh, they're approaching. <laughs> That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. This dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> very particular to ask you. Much depends upon your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. <laughs> Mr. Longcreep, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity for meeting you. That certainly sounded like a satisfactory answer, did it not? Yes. <laughs> yes, dear, if you can believe him. Oh, I don't. But that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. <laughs> True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible. Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the greatest doubts on the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. Their answers appear to be quite satisfactory. 
especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires absolute credulity. <laughs> <laughs> then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True. There are principles at stake which one cannot surrender. I have forgotten. Which of us should be the one to tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. <laughs> <laughs> Will you take the time for me? Certainly. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Our Christian names? Is that all? But we are going to be christened this afternoon. For my sake, are you willing to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, are you ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. What matters of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. <laughs> they have knowledge of links of physical courage that we women know nothing about. <coughs> Darling. Darling. <laughs> Lady Randolph, good heavens. Wiggins, what does this mean? Merely that I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young and of physical weakness in the old. <laughs> A prize, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin. I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the university extension scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. I would consider it wrong. Clearly understand that all communication between you, yourself, and my daughter must cease immediately. From this moment, on this point, as on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. On nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards to Algernon. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. May I ask if it is in this house? that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh, no, Aunt Augusta Bunbury does not live here. Bunbury is somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. <laughs> dead? When did he die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury. <laughs> I mean, Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die? Oh, he was quite explosive. Explode. <laughs> was he the victim of a revolutionary outbreak? I was not aware Miss Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, what I mean to say is Bunbury was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury did not live. So Bunbury died. <laughs> <laughs> but he must have had a great deal of confidence in the opinions of his physician. <laughs> I am glad that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action. <laughs> and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged <laughs> to be married. <laughs> Of engagements that go on 
seems to me to be considerably above the proper average. The statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think a preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? <laughs> I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were families or persons whose origin was a terminus. <laughs> Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, South West, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporan Fifeshire. Well, that is not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. I have known strange errors in that publication. <laughs> Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Markby, Markby, and Markby. Markby, Markby, and Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mr. Markby's is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. You will also be pleased to know that I have in my possession certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, confirmation, registration, whooping cough, uh, and the measles, both the German and English variety. Ah, the last crowd. Perhaps <laughs> somewhat too exciting for a young girl. Hmm. Well, then we have to go. The time approaches for our departure. Mr. Worthing, I suppose as a matter of form, I had better ask if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about £130,000 in the funds. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bragg. I'm so pleased to see you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> <laughs> 130,000 pounds, and in the funds. This card you seem to most attractive young lady now that I look at her. <laughs> so few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities, qualities that last and improve with time. We live in, I regret to say, an age of services. Come here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple, and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all of that. A thoroughly experienced French maid can produce really marvelous results in a brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lance, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. <laughs> <laughs> and after six months, nobody knew her. <laughs> Kindly turn around, sweet child. No, no, the side view is what I want. Oh. Yes, as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points of our age of its want of principle and its want of profile. Chin a little higher, dear. <coughs> Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn, and they are worn very high at present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta? There are distinct possibilities in this Cardinal's profile. Cecily is the dearest, sweetest, prettiest girl in the entire world, and I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. <laughs> Algernon, do not speak disrespectfully of society. Only people who can't get into it. <laughs> Dear child, you must know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to fall back on. I am myself not in favor of mercenary managers. When I married Lord Ruffle, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed of allowing that to stand in my way. <laughs> so I suppose I must give my hand. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. <laughs> Thank you, Lady Bracknell. And you may address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. 
Well, I think the marriage had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Oh, to speak frankly, I'm not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of getting to know each other's character before marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is never advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracken, but this engagement is entirely out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. And that consent I absolutely decline to give. May I ask on what grounds? Algernon is an extremely, I dare say, ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one deny? <laughs> it pains me, Lady Bracken, to speak frankly to you about your nephew, but I have serious doubts about his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. My nephew, Algernon, untruthful? Impossible. He attended Oxford. <laughs> I'm afraid there can be no doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence to London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house under the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I have just been informed by my butler, an entire pint of my Perrier Jouet Brut 89. A wine I was specially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, through the course of the afternoon he succeeded in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. <laughs> <laughs> what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he knew very well from the first that I have no brother that I never had a brother, and that I have no plans of having a brother in the future, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, after careful consideration, I have decided to entirely overlook my nephew's conduct. How <laughs> oh, very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, dear. How old are you? Well, I'm really only 18. But when I go to evening parties, I admit to being 20. You are perfectly right in making a small <coughs> adjustment. Indeed, no woman should be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculated. <laughs> 18, but admitting to 20 at evening party. Well, it will not be long until you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I really don't think the consent of your guardian is of any importance. Pray excuse me for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, again. But it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Gertrude does not come legally of age till she is 35. <laughs> that does not seem to be a grave objection. London society is full of women of the very highest birth, <coughs> who of their own free choice have remained 35 for years. <laughs> Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. So I see no reason. My idea Cecily would not even be more attractive at the age you mentioned than she is at present, and there will be a large accumulation of property. Algie, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could. You know that I could, Cecily. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. <laughs> I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, I know. But I do like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, is entirely out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. <laughs> Mr. Worthing. As Miss Cardew positively states, she cannot wait until she is 35. 
A remark I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature. <laughs> I beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Brackle, the matter is entirely in your hands. The moment you consent to my marriage to Gwendolyn, I will gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is the best any of us can hope for. And it's not <laughs> the destiny that I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon can choose for himself. Come dear, we've missed five, if not six trains, and this never might expose you to comment on it. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat <coughs> premature? <laughs> Both of these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? Well, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he knew that that was the way you were wasting your time and money. Then am I to understand there are to be no christenings this afternoon at all? I don't think that as things are at present, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. It grieves me to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savor of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views which I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. <laughs> However, as your present mood is one peculiarly secular, I shall return to the church at once. Indeed, I have been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, this prison has been waiting for me in the vestry. Excuse me. Prison? Did you say I was in prison? Yes, Lady Rackle. I'm on my way to join her now. Allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may be very high importance to Lord Rackle and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of the penalty? Remotely connected with education. She is the most cultivated of ladies in the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate matter. <laughs> Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has for the last three years been Miss Pardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. Spite of her, I go. I must see her, but she must be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. <laughs> I, I was told you expected me in the vestry there, Kim. I have been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. <gasps> Prism! Prism! <laughs> Come here, Prism. <laughs> Come here immediately. Prism! Where? Is that baby? Twenty-eight years ago, you left Lord Brackle's house at 105 Rotner Street in charge of a perambulator containing a baby of the male sex. You never returned. After a few weeks of the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was found at midnight standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained a manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? <laughs> Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame I do not know. I only wish that I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out of its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I placed <laughs> the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I never can forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and I placed the baby in the handbag. <laughs> but where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, I insist on knowing where you placed the handbag that had that baby in it. I left it in a 
cloak room of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria! The price of wine! I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you are not too long, I'll wait here for you all of my life. <laughs> what does this mean, Lady Dracula? I dare not even suspect. I did not tell you so. That it matters of my position. <laughs> Strange coincidences are not supposed to happen. They are hardly considered the thing. Uncle John seems strangely irritated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. Sounds as if we were having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They are always bold and often convincing. <laughs> Christian name was, but I have no doubt he had one. 
He was eccentric, I admit, but only in the later years. And that was the result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and things of that kind. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. His name would appear in the army lists of the period, I suppose, on Vanessa? Well, the general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. <laughs> but I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful books should have been my constant study. The in generals. Uh, Mallow, Max Bond, Magley, what ghastly names they had. Mark B. Migs B. Mobs, Moncrief, Lieutenant 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General 1869. Christian names. Ernest John. <laughs> My name was Ernest. <laughs> well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it is naturally Ernest. Yes, now I do remember the general was called Ernest. I knew that there was a particular reason for disliking the name. <laughs> My own Ernest. I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is very difficult for a man to learn that all his life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. <laughs> can you forgive me? I can. For I feel that you are sure to change. My own darling. Letitia. Frederick. At last. Cecily, at last. Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta. For the first time in my life, I've discovered the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs> 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 